today I'm speaking to Anavas Aga, or better known as Anu Aga. From the year 1996 to the year 2004, Anu was the chairperson of Thermax, a company that provides engineering solutions. Anu stepped up the role of executive chairperson from a then role as a vice president of human resources. Anu handed over the reins of the company to her daughter, Meher Padamji, in 2004, after taking it to a tremendous growth period. Anu, your father started the company. Your late husband, Rohinton, took it to another level. You made it even more successful. And now your daughter, who herself was named one of India's 30 high achievers, is leading Thermax, which is present in at least 14 countries right now. Tell me something. What is the secret? I think right from my father's time, my husband and all of us could attract talent and create a work culture where people felt empowered. Though they didn't own the company, they could make decisions and they could come up with ideas and run with it. So I think we created a work environment which attracted talent. I think we also had certain ethical standards which also attracted people. We are very innovative and for that you have to have tolerance for mistakes because for everything that works there are many things that don't work. So there's room for mistakes. Uh, we have a good reputation with our customers and in our community. And I've heard a lot of employees say they feel proud to work for Thermax. So I think these are some of the things mm. which went right. We have not done well also, so it's not that it's a straight line going up. Of course. But yeah. we've learned from our mistakes and we are not afraid. Your daughter, uh, Meher Padamji, was named one of India's 30 high achievers recently. How do you feel as a mother? Very proud, extremely happy because to me she's a wonderful daughter. If she was just an, just an achiever but not a good human being, it would mean nothing to me. But she's a good mother, a good wife, was a very good daughter-in-law. So I think she has done everything very well. So I'm very proud of her. Hmm. Um, did you get your values more from your mother or your father, would you say? Or a little bit of both? Maybe both, but my father was more articulate and I saw them more clearly. Uh, mother, as I grew up, I realized some of the values. Mm. Uh, when you took over the leadership of Thermax to become its uh, executive chairperson, you were actually leading its HR division at that time. Now, how were you able to make that critical switch from leading an HR division, which is more uh, people-oriented, to actually driving the business and driving all its uh, necessary drivers to uh, the level that it was at the time? Uh, I was not an engineer, and ours is an engineering company. I was not good at finance, but I think business is about people. It's not about machinery or finances, and I knew my people well. And I didn't feel bad to say I don't know and ask their help. And even stand very firm for things which I believed in. So I think, and lots of people supported me, this turnaround was not of my doing only. A lot of people helped me. So with the support of many people and asking for help, it was easy. So would you say that having the ability to develop a group of, uh, if I use, may use the term, co-leadership in your organization, that really helped you. Uh, uh, sure. And not feel threatened by people knowing far more than I knew in their subjects. So I gathered experts around me, and they were able to help me. Um, most family-owned businesses usually find it a bit of a challenge trying to make that differentiation between ownership and operatorship at the highest level. 
And how was your family able to do that very nicely? Uh, owning the company and making sure that the company is run and managed in the most professional manner. This didn't happen during my husband's time. He was the owner and the most professionally suited person to run this company. But when I took over, I was the executive chairperson. But after we turned around, I realized that I was not the right person to run it on a day-to-day -day business, a day-to-day -to -day, uh, time, day-to-day uh, -day basis. Uh, also, all our investments are in Thermex. So it's in our own enlightened self-interest that we select a person more suited to run this company than thinking that because we are owners, we are naturally the best. So I think my daughter and my son-in-law who were running hardcore businesses hands-on. For them it was difficult to decide and I told them they could be either on the board or be executives. They can't be both. That was a tough decision. And you made but that clear? I made it very clear. I can be very tough. But today they bless me for helping them to make that decision. They have so much of spare time to spend with their children, to pursue their hobbies, and yet in many ways they can influence the company also. So they have the best of everything. You have achieved so much in your lifetime already, both the professional uh, area and also the work that you're doing for, for society uh, right now. Tell me, um, how does being a woman make it uh, easier or harder for you to do all that in India? Mm. See, I didn't come up the professional ladder. I was asked to be the CEO overnight, chairperson. So I had to fight more of my internal battles of self-doubt, whereas from the outside world, I got a lot of support. Uh, I've never found people within the company or from outside ever uh, coming in my way. In fact, because I was a widow and a woman, they really helped me to succeed. So I haven't come across difficulties. I also feel if you're sure of yourself and not yet arrogant and with humility ask for help, people see that you succeed. You are not unfamiliar with death. Um, you lost your husband and your mother-in-law as well as you lost your son, Kurush, within a very short span of time. And my dog. And your, your company, dog. Your, your family pet dog. as well, within the same time period, yes. Um, it is said that your lesson in life is Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. You were quoted to have used yes, that yes. many, many times. Would you like to explain that? Sure. See, when you lose someone very dear, there is physical pain, there is mental pain, and you have to go through it, whether you like it or not. But if you don't keep asking, why did this happen to me? Then pain has a time. Afterwards, it goes away. But why did this happen has no answer. And that's when you move into suffering. And suffering is the self-torture by calling death as a tragedy, by saying, I'm a good human being. Why did this happen to me? So just this question, why, is the suffering area. And I would, for anything, you may lose a job, you may be divorced. Why has no answer. You just have to deal with it. It is said that, legend has it that, after all these three losses, losses of lives, which are very dear to you, you gave yourself three weeks to mourn them. And on, at the end of the third week, you were back at work. How did you provide focus to yourself? What was the source of this constant, continuous energy that kept you going, Anu? Uh, without being dramatic with my husband, on the second day I was at work, because the board met and decided that I should be the executive chairperson. With my son, I took three weeks off. Uh, after my husband died, I went for a Buddhist meditation program called Vipassana. It's a 10-day residential program where you're not allowed to speak, read, write. So you have to go within yourself. And I discovered my personal power, which is available to everyone. 
It's not just I was unique. We don't tap it. And once, having got my personal power, I felt I don't have to be like my husband. He was a different human being. I'm different. But give out my best. That's all is expected. Don't keep comparing with anyone. And I internalized that, got a lot of strength from within, and that's helped me. I practice my meditation every single day, so that helps, yes. Did you discover anything new about yourself in that process? Oh, very much. Uh, I, if I was told, would you be able to ever run this company, I would have said never. Uh, I took a stand against one of the politicians. I would have been asked, would you ever do that? Would you have the strength to do that? I would have said, never. But once you face death, you realize you can face anything in life. Because what could be worse than that? And you come as a winner, come out as a winner means not mourning and feeling sorry for yourself, but realizing it's inevitable. I don't know whether this interview would, will be aired, but the truth is you and I and everyone in this room are going to die. And we don't accept that. We think, let's not talk about something like that. We are young. You are an old woman. <laughs> Thank you for bringing a dose of reality to this <laughs> conversation. Uh, anu, you, you are awarded the Padma Shri for social work by the Indian government, which is the fourth highest award to be given to a civilian in India. You are the chairperson for Teach for India. You have been nominated to the Rajya Sabha, the higher, the upper house of the parliament in India. You are also, madam, the 79th richest person in India. Uh, I don't mean to embarrass you here, but let me ask you this. Which of these are you most proud of and why? Being the chairperson for Teach for India, mm -hmm. I think awards and rewards are given by the external world and they don't mean much to me. There are other people's evaluation of my work. In Teach for India, I know the wonderful work being done to bridge the inequity gap in education. And I was partnering the Lady Shaheen, who started it right from day one. And I've seen it grow, spread to seven cities, and impact the lives of thousands of students who are underprivileged. So I'm very excited about being the chairperson of Teach for India. If there is one thing that, uh, that you could do to, um, to change or to improve the livelihood of the uh, underprivileged children in India right now, what might it be? Please let me cheat and say two. <laughs> uh, one is malnourishment. India used to have 42%, which is the highest in the world. I'm told it's come down to 32. It's still the highest in the world. And malnourishment not only affects your physical growth, but stunts your mental growth also. And it's irreversible. So I think malnourishment. But I have chosen to be in education because even if you're nourished, but you are not educated, and quality education, I don't mean just any education, what's, what good is it? You'll always remain poor. You will not have an opportunity to come out of your poverty. So I think giving our children quality education and giving them an equal chance to come up in life is very important for me. At this point in your life, having achieved so much and done so much more for the society that you live in, who inspires you? Who is your role model, Anu? From a distance, I would say Gandhiji was my role model. I really admire him, but that's from a distance. I didn't meet him, I don't know him personally. But from nearby, it was my husband. And it's far more difficult to be a role model to a person whom you know so well. And he encouraged me to be a career woman. He encouraged me to think, be compassionate. I learned a lot from my husband. Tell me, how are you as a grandmother? Oh, I haven't spent a lot of time, but my grandchildren, I know the word grand. Now why they're called grand. Okay. They are grand, they're outstanding. And we go on holidays together, just the three of us. We spend six holidays together. 
Wow. And I traveled to Singapore, where my granddaughter is studying, at least thrice a year to meet. She comes very often. Urbana, I've been only once. It's too far. And he's a boy of 20. He doesn't like his grandmother coming up to see him very often. <laughs> but they mean a world to me, and I adore them. Um, how, what's next for you? What's next? I don't know. Whatever comes. Okay. I don't know, but I'm happy with whatever comes. But I think at this stage of my life, it's not so much achieving in the outside world as also gaining internal peace, being in very good relationship with people that matter, and making some impact with the wealth we have for the people who, can't, who are needy. Having achieved so much. You keep saying that. I don't feel I have. Well, but anyway. And, and, and having acquired so much. Sure. And um, what gets you up in the morning? and still be fired up and, and you know, ready to face the day as it is. What gets you going? I mean, what, what is that thing that burns in you? I think I'm a very positive person by and large. I'm a jack-in-the-box that comes up after any difficulty. Uh, I, as I said, I've discovered my inner power. Yes. And I see so much of goodness in this world. So negativity doesn't bother me. And I feel there's so much to be done. Also. My meditation, I look forward to it in the morning. Sometimes I don't, but then there's the discipline. I have to do it. But most days, I like it. I get happiness. Your husband was known to have uh, you know, uh, joked about you saying that uh, you, your, your incessant chattering mm. uh, is a source of his energy. And how is a person who is known to be an incessant chatter you know, a managed uh, Vipassana, which requires to be very quiet for a long time? I I think I'm not an incessant chatterer. I wouldn't describe my, and my, what my husband said it was, I'd love to see you quiet for 10 days, which was he had a wonderful sense of humor. Yes, you know something, before going, I thought this would be the most difficult. That was the easiest. And after 10 days, talking was a problem. I loved the silence. That wasn't difficult. What was difficult was sitting down and meditating for 10 hours a day. That was very difficult, but not speaking was wonderful. And my final question to you, Anu, how would you like to be remembered? Someone who lived a full life and who cared for people around. Yeah. Arnabas Anu Aga, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. And to our viewers out there, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. This is Mohammed Sabri saying goodbye from the leaders' room.